Hey there, and thank you for clicking on to watch this recap of how to get your business online for beginners. Today podcast will last about 45 minutes and my contact details are at the end. So if you have any questions, please feel free to drop me an email. My name is Patricia Owens and I work for a management consultancy practice called Full Circle Management Solutions. We are based in Belfast. Um, I'm just going to share my slides with you so that you can see what we're going to be covering today. So today's uh, podcast is all about getting your business online. I'm going to take you through the slides um, as they appear. However, um, if you want to join into one of the workshops, there will be a few coming up. Um, you'll see those on the council website advertised. In terms of the content for today, it is very much about getting your business online for beginners. So uh, it's taking you from the stage that you are, helping you to think, have I achieved that? Is that? Am I getting it right? Have I evaluated everything that I have done to date? Is it working? And how to move on from that stage, so how to take it very much to the next level. There will be a few exercises scattered throughout um, the workshop at that point. And if you notice, you hit pause in the podcast. Take 15 minutes and then we will go on with um, the podcast today. So the key objectives today are how to allow you to, um, to know how to define your customer. A lot of people, whenever I do workshops and one-to-one -one mentoring um, as part of council funded programs, say to me, well, I could sell to anyone or uh, my customer really, um, anybody that um, dot, dot, dot. And I suppose today is all about, well, that's great, but where do they want to hear from you today? So um, you will have customer segments and it's really getting you to think about those customer segments and thinking, actually, whereabouts do they want to hear from me rather than me just talking to the mass um, on Facebook, on Instagram or wherever we're thinking about going to the after today. Um, there will be another podcast um, linked with this um, and it's very much um, an introduction to the four, um, the big four as we call them, platforms. So that's Facebook, um, pin, uh, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn and Twitter. Um, now in terms of those platforms, they're all great, they all work very well, but they're all for very different customers. So in terms of should I be on all four, that's where we'd really like to be making that decision for you guys to say, should I be on all four? Um, but again, that's on another platform. What we're also gonna do is learn about the process for getting your business online. If you haven't taken steps to get your business online, is it something that you need to do? Is it something that's a priority for the business? If it is a priority for the business, when do we need to do it or how do we go about it? What are the priorities? Um, rather than going and trying and doing everything today, um, can we leave something for a month? Can we leave something for two months so that it's manageable and maintainable when we go back to the status quo of being in our business every day and not having this extra time that a lot of people have found themselves in at the moment. We're going to set goals and create a vision with objectives. There's no point if I say to somebody, what's your reason for being online? And they say, to make sales. Well, you're never going to think that you're successful online because the one thing that you will want to do is generate sales. If you generate five sales, you'll want 10. If you generate 10, you'll want 20. So it's about actually rewarding yourself once you hit those key objectives, creating a vision why you want to be online. That will drive you. If you have a goal of having 10 posts a week, you will want to put 10 posts a week live. If you have a goal to generate sales, you'll have a call to action. If you want to get um, user-generated content and you want to gather that so that you can use that, you may well run a competition to ask people to send you their content. But in terms of having a goal, you don't know what kind of content that you will be generating um, until such times as you have a goal in place. And it'll help you to make a plan. And then we're going to look at our current marketing strategy and actually developing a plan or where to start with that plan. Now, again, a lot of people have a lot of time in their hands that they maybe don't have usually. They have business just to run. So what I'm trying to get across is how easy it is to make a plan, how you know proactively you need to be online if we've got a plan in place and how much easier and time um, saving this could be. But essentially, it's not about saying, right, I'm going to put seven posts live a week on, you know, multiple platforms. That could generate up to about 28, uh, maybe more posts. If you don't have time for that, the one thing that Facebook, Instagram, Twitter or LinkedIn are going to punish you for is consistency. 
if you post once a week and it's good content and people engage on it, people are going to see that content. If you post seven times a week, the platforms are going to insist that you post seven times a week. So we want to keep it active, but we also want to keep it consistent that you can manage it on the flip side whenever we're back to doing the day-to-day -day running of the business. So firstly, we're going to look at the marketing message. Is your market in a planned process at the minute? If the answer to that is no, that's not to say that your business is bad. It's actually, well, is it working? Evaluating it. If it's not a planned process, is that okay for you? Can that work? What is your marketing message at the moment? The one thing that we want you know, any company to know is what is my marketing message? What do I want to be known for? Am I known for that? Is that what my customers want me for? So you might want to be known as um, an ethical company, green company, eco-friendly and all of the rest. And that really does not matter to your customers. You have to make a decision then. Do I want to push those customers away and very much market it as an eco-friendly company and attract new customers? Or do I want to fit in to what my customers expect and want and actually drive my company forward that way? Is your marketing message consistent throughout all of your platforms? And again, this comes from tone. This comes from what you're putting out there. If you have customers and they like that friendly, that um, fun, that, you know, that bit of not what they're expecting or not that professional approach that they may be, they're wanting online and then they walk into the store, or they walk into your office and it's very much a professional situation. Your marketing message is very different um, in face-to-face -face as it would be um, on your social media platforms. So in which case they're going to feel intimidated, they're going to feel scared. So it's not about actually having that, um, that fun and friendly marketing message online. It's actually, I need to look at this and I need to make it more professional because that's what they'll get when they come in through the door. Um, it doesn't mean that you turn those customers away. You still can be friendly online, um, and that's perfectly fine. Nobody's saying that you can't be friendly, but it has to be very consistent with what people expect when they come through the door. What types of marketing do you carry out at the minute? If it's not planned, do you just throw posts up sporadically? A lot of my, cl my clients, when I'm talking to them, they say, it's maybe I haven't posted in a couple of days, I must get something up. Is that when you're really at your most creative? Is that when your customers want to hear from you? If that's not the case, that marketing is falling deaf ears and it's not really what you would engage with and it's not really what your customers would engage with. It's not going to work. Okay, so why is this a good idea? If we segment our customers or if we actually look at the different customer types that we're wanting to put our message across to, some sales would be good because some segments um, of customers will be good because they'll provide you with repeat business. There's certain customers out there that will continually buy from you. They're loyal. They're not going to look elsewhere. Well, if that's the case, then they're the kind of customers that we want to be talking to. And our marketing message has to be consistent with those people. Some customers will buy more products than others, in which case do we have to look after them? So if they're not our typical customer, but they're by and larger, is that more important to us than attracting 25 smaller companies um, to buy? What do we have the time to do? In which case, what does our marketing have to say to attract those larger customers? Do they want to hear from us day and daily or is once a week enough? Some customers will buy new products more readily. So in terms of content, that's great. It's letting us generate lots of content online, but in terms of new products, we can bring in products that are maybe going to be more um, profitable, in which case these are customers that we want to be selling to. What kind of customers or where do they want to hear from us? Some customers will be less price conscious. If somebody's less price conscious, we're able to sell to them and not worry about the price of things. Again, that is that a benefit or actually are we cheaper in the market and if somebody's less price conscious, they can go and look at our competitors. We want to be looking at the customers that are going to continually buy from us. Will customers give you the opportunity to put things right if you make mistakes? You're only human at the end of the day. You can't 
make everything brilliant. You can't be something to all people. You have to make yourself different. You have to have a USP. So you might have the same product, but is the customer's um, service that somebody is expecting when they buy, is the extra treats that they get, is that going to make a difference for them? Are they going to like, give you the opportunity to put things right if you make mistakes, if you send the wrong product, or you send your product is delayed and getting out there, especially at the minute when it's royal meal, it's maybe not your fault. Again, if we're talking to those customers, are we putting a marketing message out there that rewards them? Or are they going to refer, to refer us to others? So are there customers out there that we can encourage through our market and actually tell other people how good we are, how good our product or service is? Then they're the type of people we want to put out there. But we need to know what we are marketing and how we're marketing and what customers we want to market out to. That's to say, if we have a certain segment that is on Instagram and a certain segment of our followers that are maybe on Twitter, they want to hear very different messages. They're very different customer groups, but we want to keep the overall message consistent, which is we have a high quality product at a high quality price. That's what a lot of people want to put out there. Maybe it's actually we have this product available in mass amounts. That could be exactly what somebody wants to hear. But we have to look at our overall marketer message and then break up each of our customers. So the next slide then is um, a exercise for you. So if you want to hit pause um, once you've heard the instructions. So it's all about segmenting the customers in a spire shop. I use this example is because spire for every single person. I don't think there's many people in the market that have not used a spire shop in their lifetime. So in terms of the customers, there's lots of different segments, but that doesn't mean that I wouldn't buy from them because they market to one or the other. Okay, what I want you to think is actually when I segment these customers, where do those people want to hear about us? Okay, so if you hit pause now and I'll go on to the next slide. In terms of segments then, if we're looking at the segments within a spar shop, we've got the white van man, we've got the schools and shops, the office workers, the basket shoppers, the lunchtime shoppers, the school runs, whenever the moms are going to the school in five minutes, home time rush, when they haven't got anything for the dinner and they haven't got the, the motivation to cook something, they want a ready meal, or the evening shoppers that have all, everything done and they've an hour in their hands before nine o'clock and they want to drop in. They have what these customers, these segments want is hot food counter, papers, bakery and snacks, papers again for the schools and shops, the office workers, looking at different things within the paper, what the white, white van man is interested in and what the office workers may be completely different things. That doesn't mean that the paper can't be available to both of those. Groceries and bread, milk, tea, so it's just essentials for the basket shoppers. They don't want to be lugging a whole lot of groceries home. The lunchtime, they want sandwiches or hot food. Again, there's hot food come up. Doesn't mean that if I market it to the lunchtime shoppers, that the white van man isn't going to buy the hot food. School runs, they're looking for sweets and they're looking for maybe the groceries to reward the children, get the dinner sorted. 15 minutes apiece while they do their homework. The home time, the rush hour, they're looking for the ingredients for the dinner. They're looking for the telegraph to see what happened that day, what they need to catch up on. They don't have time for the news. They've missed the news, so the telegraph will do for local news. Even the shoppers, then, they're maybe more um, organised. They're looking for the lunchbox ingredients for the next day. They're looking for a bunch of flowers to tidy the house that they spent all day cleaning. Every single one of these is a different market and message, but that does not mean that in terms of who I'm going to buy or why I market it, that I'm going to be marketing. The marketing message is still exactly the same as far as there for everyone. In terms of the people that I talk to, if I talk to the white van man on um, line and I put the hot food counter, the products at six o'clock in the morning, the lunchtime runners, they might not see it because they're not online. If they do see it, they're going to think, you know, that's the breakfast, that's the fry, I must get one of those on Saturday when I'm off. So it's not about turning customers off, it's actually about advising them. And if they want to interpret that in a different way, they absolutely can, but they don't have to. Okay, so what I want you guys to do then, and this is taking another 15 minutes, until you, um, you look at who buys your product or your service, it is very difficult to establish what your market and messages should be. So I think from listening, to the segments within the spire shop, we maybe identified that not everybody would buy our product or not everybody would buy our service. 
but definitely we can be promoting to every single one of them. So what I want you to do is look at the two exercises on the screen. Decide who your key customer groups. List the customer group serviced by your business. So you're thinking, I, I sell to everyone. Is there a difference between a 15-year-old female, a 45-year-old female? Are they interested in different things? It might be exactly the same product, but there's a different reason for buying it. Is it a gift? And then what I want you to do is actually, in the second column, take each of those customer groups and see begin to think if I was a 15 year old female where would I want to hear this message what day of the week what time what would the message be break it down then we've got a 30 year old female what does she want to know what does she care about where does she want to hear it and when does she want to see it and work your way through each of your customer groups it'll take longer if you're selling to everyone but in terms of our marketing message, we can then make a plan based on knowing who that our customers are. Then we can move forward. Okay, so once you've done that, then hit play again. We're going to look at the marketing process. Have you ever heard somebody say, my product sells itself? Do you ever find yourself saying that? That's because the marketing mix is right before we even started. If you have the right product or service, your product may well sell itself. But if it's not at the right price, people won't buy it. If it's not promoted in the right way, they won't know about it. If it's not made available to them in the right place where they want to buy it, they'll not buy it. And if it's not promoted or shown or sold by the right people, it's not going to sell itself. So it's not about having a product that'll sell itself. It's actually having the right product or the right service. What people want, we don't have to convince them that they want to buy. We just have to make it available to them. We're charging the right price. I always say to my clients, it's not about being the cheapest and it's not about being the dearest. It's about being value for money. So you could be in danger of pricing yourself too low. If you're too low, what's the first thing that people do? They think it's not worth, it's not as good of quality. It's not as good of price. So there has to be something wrong with it. It must be def default or it must be second hand. So it's about actually making it the right price that people say, then and around the right price, that's what such and such are charging it at and they're looking at your competitors. They're happy to pay that price because they know that that's what it's worth. It's promoted in the right way. So if you are slightly dear, you are slightly um, more expensive or cheaper, if you have it promoted in the right way, so you're not talking about the price, you're talking about the value, you're talking about the reason why they want to buy from you, what are the extras that they get with it, what makes it different if it's a new product that's not available, why do they need it, the benefits, all of a sudden it's promoted in the right way, it doesn't matter about the price because the value carries through the promotion. Made available to them in the right place. If you are promoting it online to somebody through Facebook, can they buy it there? Do they want to buy it there? Do you have to look at your website? Have you told them how to buy on your social media platform? So if we're not selling online, we have to tell them when the shop's open so that they can make plans to visit the shop. We have to make it actually, do you know what? This is where I want to buy it and it's not available there. Have we asked them that question? Where would you like to see this product? So if everybody is telling you that they want to see it in Tesco's, you have to approach Tesco's and get a listing on Tesco's to actually get your product available in the right place that it's going to sell. Do you have market research there that you can back up that conversation? Is that going to make it easy? No. But is that going to make it worthwhile? Yes. In terms of if you have a shop, if you have um, people that do the deliveries, if you have people that do the, the customer service or the fixing if something goes wrong, is that the right people? that are going to drive your product forward and sell your product. If not, well then they're not the right people. You want people that are smiling. If somebody's going to wear your branded jacket on a Saturday and they're not working, are they going to be in the right places? Have you made that point where they can't wear this? Because it needs to be the right people that are carrying your marketing and that is all marketing. Okay, so the next few slides break down what we've talked about, all of the different keys to the five. Promotional tools then. Within promotional tools, it's not about just looking and saying, actually, 
I want to be online, I want to get a social media platform, I want to get a website and that's me. These all, these are all promotional tools that come together. We're looking at website and digital marketing, yes, but it has to go hand in hand with something. Are people going to find your website just because you have a website? That's going to be very difficult. Some people say it takes six months before Google even finds your website. So we need that to go hand in hand with digital marketing. Promotional literature. Is there something that I can put out in the local shops, in the local newspaper, in the local um, door-to-door deliveries where I can actually put nice promotional literature that's going to sell my product but drive people to my website, if that's what I want to do. Drive people to my social media to find out about me. Are the people that I'm targeting all going to be on social media? Will they shop online? Can I take that fear away? How can I take that fear away? I'm actually convincing people that it's safe to buy online. Word of mouth. Word of mouth probably, it's at the top because it's probably the most important. I suppose if we're looking at it in terms of what can word of mouth do, you have no control over word of mouth. That can be good or it can be bad. So we don't want to solely rely on word of mouth. But if we can encourage it and we know that it's going to be positive, it's going to work for our business. Is our branding consistent with the people? We've now looked at our customer segments in terms of branding. Is that right? Is that targeting the right people? Is my branding very young? Is it very, um, like, um, is it mature? Um, am I targeting people who would like it to be more my more mature um, in terms of my branding? Or am I looking at people and my branding, I want it to be more, um, a professional and it's more friendly so we need to actually look at our customers and say is my branding carrying that through for me if somebody came across my logo or came across my promotional literature if i have a luxury product am i actually putting that across that people understand that it's a luxury product so when i charge slightly more they see my branding and they're happy to pay that because they know that it's worth more Exhibitions, am I doing exhibitions? Do they work for my business? At the minute, yes, there'll be none, so that's very difficult to look at. But in terms of going forward, do I need to set a budget across? You know, it's not just paying for the stand or paying for the stall, it's actually looking at the travel there, the expenses of the people there. If I have four people that are going to approach me at one time in the stand, will I have four people to talk to them, or will I lose potentially two? customers because I wasn't able to talk to them so do I need to employ more people to come to those exhibitions with me again are they the right people to push my product if so are they going to be more expensive so I need to look at the cost of that going forward so that if I'm going to promote people to use my website to look at my digital marketing we only get one chance of people going online and looking for you so in terms of if we are pushing them, are we pushing them at the right time? Are we pushing them? Are we doing an exhibition in January for Christmas when people aren't thinking about it? If that's the case, what's the point? If we're doing an exhibition for Halloween and it's you know in the run up to Christmas, people are thinking about Christmas. So we need to look at actually the timing of these things that we're doing. Advertising them, that could be um, in radio, that could be on TV. Have I got a budget for it? Is it time and right? Are people going to buy? Um, we've all seen the like of Tesco um, have changed their advertising completely and they're doing um, television advertising about how they've overcome um, COVID-19. Um, not overcome it, but overcome the obstacles and they're still open. In terms of that, they brought that together very quickly, but it is encouraging people. It's making people sit in an evening and think, what do I need in the shops tomorrow? I think that I'd be safe if I go there. It's reassuring, it's less scaremongering. So in terms of cost, it might be very costly, but has it actually worked in terms of driving people to the shop that maybe wouldn't have wanted to go into the shop because of this the lockdown? Personal selling, am I putting my personality across? If people want to buy from me, am I letting them? So in terms of putting my product out there, it's my product. There might be 10 other people that have similar products. Why would they buy from me? It's my personality. It's me selling it. It's me doing the demos. It's me and my team doing this, doing that. So all of a sudden, if we have the right people selling the product, driving the product forward, putting the product in the right place, it's definitely going to work. Point of sales materials, when people buy, might not be in our shop, 
but are we given the people behind the counter enough um, ammunition to actually sell our product? Are we given the um, shops enough marketing material to push our product forward? We are in control of what we put out there in point of, so point of sale materials. If we give it, people are more inclined to actually push that product. We've all seen it with the like of bartenders. If they're given more rewards for selling a certain brand, they're more inclined when somebody says, you know, what do you recommend? They're more inclined to promote what they are getting more rewards for. They're only normal. So are we given enough point of sales materials, training, information, rewards to actually drive the sales of our products if we're selling it in our own shop? Have we got enough point of sales that we're pushing it hard enough? Have, are we um, engaging with enough people? Our point of sales are also our people. PR companies, do we need PR companies to help us? Have we got the skills in-house to do this? Um, be it copyright, be it getting our um, information in the right newspapers and articles, um, be it actually having those contacts that we maybe don't have. So in terms of all of this and bringing it all together, what have we the time for? What have we the skills for? And can we outsource any of that to different people? Direct mail, Boris did it. Boris sent out letters to people. It's not, um, people always think mail's a, a dying marketing tool. It's definitely not. It depends who we're targeting. We have to look at our customer segmentation and think, do they read mail when it comes through the door? Do they read mail when it comes inside a newspaper? Do they read mail when it comes from the Royal Mail, when it's um, directly addressed to them? Does that make it stronger? So in terms of actually putting um, newspapers or um, articles, all of those things can work if we have the right segment group. So our goals and objectives. Again, I want you guys to take 15 minutes to actually sit down and think, who or why am I online? So the exercise at the top is if you're already online. The exercise at the bottom, if you're not yet online, but you're thinking I should probably get online. What I want you to do is answer yourself this question. This might change at the very end of these slides, but I want your initial um, content there. So why are you online? What is the reason? And again, I've mentioned it at the very start, if it's to drive seal, put that down. That might change at the end of these slides, but ultimately, initially, before you started this, if you're already online, why did you go online? If you are online, what I want you to do is um, list the last three things that you carried out to promote your business online. And again, if this is planned, you can probably do it off the top of your head. If it's not, then you might have to go and check, and that might tell you things about your marketing plan at the minute. But what we want to be able to do from this is actually look at the last three things that we did to promote our business and think, what customer segments was I talking to when I did that? Have I left any customer segments out in the last three things that I did? Um, if we're not online, why have you logged on to this podcast? Why do you want to start promoting your business online? And I suppose, based on what we've said so far, what are the first three things that you would do? What do you think your priorities are in terms of the money that you have, the budget that you have available to you, and actually pushing this forward? So do you think, thinking about your three customer segments, that it's all going to be online? Uh, do you think that it's better if you do something in the local newspaper first to build a bit of awareness? If you do something in the local newspaper, what's your call to action? Do you want them to buy? Do they have to go online for that? So have we got the right calls to action and guides in place? Smart goals then. So if you can hit pause after that and then we'll look at smart goals. Here are three examples of goals and objectives um, for you. The smart goals basically mean that something is specific. Um, it's I can look at it in three months and I can say I achieved it because I know where I started and where I wanted to go. I set a goal. It's measurable because I can actually measure something. Um, it's tangible, um, it's attainable, so it's achievable. It's not something that I know I will never be able to achieve and I'll be annoyed at the end of it. It's realistic, so have I got the resources in house? Um, and is it realistic in terms of, is it something I want? Is it my overall goal um, to do that? And it's time bound. If it's not time bound, 
your SMART goal will go on and on and on forever and you have no motivation to actually make that SMART goal. So the time brings it all together in terms of you then said, I want to achieve this by this time and I can do it because I'm going to do X, Y and Z. So there will be three or four actions come out of a SMART goal, SMART objective, but that's grand. Three examples of objectives are brand engagement, enhancing PR or lead generation. Sometimes people say to me, what's the difference in brand engagement and enhancing PR? It's very different. Um, like they might in terms of um, the overall, um, they come together as one, and there's no reason why you couldn't have all three of these smart goals. But what brand engagement does for you, it actually builds a bit of a conversation. It builds anticipation. It builds where people are checking back. They want to engage with your brand. They want to send you content. They want to enter competitions. They want to buy your product. Enhancing PR is all about the education. It's all about telling people what you have available and letting them make a decision do they want to buy. Um, if there's maybe um, things that they need to learn about your product in terms of the benefits before they go ahead and do that, that's where enhancing PR comes in. Brand engagement comes after whenever they've bought or they're asking questions about it. Lead generation then is just sales. Lead generation cannot be your only objective because the one thing that lead generation leads to is you continually posting things like want to buy, um, catch us online, uh, call into the shop, call in and see such and such or sales manager, here's a link. Would you want to buy from somebody that's consistently telling you things like that? where if that's milked in with your brand engagement and your enhancing PR, you're only educating people. You've brought them to the point where they know that you have the right product. You, they know you have the right um, price. They know that you're selling it at the right place. And all you're doing is just telling them how to buy. Okay, so we'll break down the first two. So we have got um, brand engagement and enhancing PR and there's some examples to the side there and what I want you to do is look at um, the customer service element of it so O2 don't know who they're dealing with they sell um, to a lot of people online and they can't make assumptions of people so they can't decide that one person wants to be dealt with in a friendly manner and one person wants to be dealt with in a professional manner they're dealing with businesses and they're dealing with one customers one-to-one -one. So in terms of this, any problems on um, the Isle of Wight at the moment, we tried ringing a few times and it went straight to voicemail. So all of a sudden then O2 UK come back, hi, DM us the postcode, we'll take a closer look. Um, all of a sudden they're, they're admitting that they might be a fault. They're admitting how they're going to fix it and they're asking for more information to help. But they're doing it in a professional manner. They're doing it in a friendly but professional manner so that people know what to expect whenever they're doing customer service. Fusion want to be known as fast, friendly, um, upbeat, but convenient. So somebody then is saying something about their paper bag, um, which Fusion are famous for serving um, their takeaways in, that um, they dropped it because the rain ripped the paper bag. Or meant paper bag was um, less strong. So what they said is, hey, instead of hi, cheers at the end, let's have a chat, fire me over an email. They're keeping it friendly, they're keeping it fun. People that make a decision to buy in Boosham know that they're buying off somebody that's friendly. So they're expecting that type of conversation back and Boosham are keeping that market and message clear so that when somebody comes in, they're not expecting you know, a professional, um, you know, PC conversation, they can be having a bit of fun with their customers. Um, in terms of user generated content, um, this company is a makeup brand. Um, the guy that is the head of it isn't a makeup artist, however, he is still putting up makeup products because this um, makeup artist wants to get her name out there. She sends him content and he's able to pick that up. He didn't have to generate that content, but he's able to promote the products that he is making based on um, somebody sending him content. Did that happen by accident? Potentially, but at the start, he had to ask people to send him the content that he would give them a shout out. So it's working for the makeup artist because he has a huge following, but it's also working for him because he's able to put that content out and it's not he has to go and pay somebody to create this content for him. 
So being relevant, there's no point to make up artists putting something out about um, buildings. There's no point uh, Bougian putting something out about legislation. There's no point O2 putting something out about food. They're being relevant to their own industry. They're looking after their own industry. Uh, they're building relationships online. So he's um, the makeup artist building a relationship with either the makeup artist and the customers because they're seeing what's what's available or what you could do with this product. O2 are building a relationship with that person without knowing who that person is or what that customer's contract is in. So again, people then see that and think, actually, do you know what? They look after their customers are quite like that. Um, and Bougian are keeping it fun. fun. They're keeping it um, funny where they're building a bit of a rapport, but they're also um, helping people to think, you know, I can work with this. That's a definite company that I can talk to. Okay. And I suppose responding to mentions and customer service requests, that's the most important thing. When we create a plan, we have something that we know will take us an hour to schedule, an hour to plan. There's two hours. That's that's not all done in one day where that's just fired up and we don't have to do anything about it. We actually want to do that and then we want to stay um, reactive on our page so when the like of these customers um, send through reviews or questions we're actually reacting straight away we're given that bit of content for that bit of connection where people then will continue to do that because they feel that you're approachable that you care about what their thoughts are and brand loyalty so what can I track I can track mentions reviews conversations in terms of what I can track, I need to know that I can look and see what it is at the minute. So if we're looking at mentions, I need to look back over the last week, month, year, and see how many times I mentioned so that I can track that going forward. In terms of reviews, I need to know how many I've received in the last week, day, month, and then I can track that going forward. And the same with conversations. You set how many conversations. So is that, if there's five, posts within that conversation is that five conversations or one you set it and then you can track it so setting a smart goal then i want to gain 10 five-star reviews in facebook or google by the end of 2020 or i want to increase post engagements in facebook by 50 percent by the end of 2020 if i don't know what my post engagements are in facebook then i cannot do that smart goal i need to go and look at that and say that's what I have, um, that's what I want to push it to. So by 50%, if it was 10, I need to get it um, increased, okay? My 10 five-star reviews, we don't know if that's achievable because we don't know what we had. But what we do know is if we go back and look and say it took us two years to get 10 reviews on Facebook or Google, then is that realistic that we're going to get it by the end of 2020 this year? If we think, well, we never pushed it before. So all of a sudden, we're giving ourselves something to strive for because we're creating content based around getting those five-star reviews on Facebook or Google by the end of 2020. If we're pushing it, we, we're go it's, it, it's our goal. We're creating our content around it. Why can't it be achievable? So it's actually motivating yourself to get there. Lead generation then. So if we're looking at lead generation, I have educated my customers to the point where I know that they want to buy from me. Then I just let them go. Look at my competitors, price them out of the market. No, I keep them engaged. I give them a call to action. I show them how to buy. They're a captivated audience. They know about my product. They know about my pricing. I'm going to tell them how to buy, be that in a shop, be that um, online, be that one of my customers because I sell to the middle person who sells on. Um, but if I don't tell a customer how to buy or what action I want them to take next, how can I say that lead generation didn't happen if I don't ask people when they're in the shop, where did you hear about us? The one thing that we need to be thinking about is then I have to get the whole team on board. The whole team need to be asking that question. If only two people are asking that question, I can't set that as my smart goal. So in terms of what can I try? Website traffic, if you don't have a website, that's not going to work. If your website's just new, is that something that I want to be ranking straight away? My click-through rate, so people going from my social media platforms to somewhere else, have I got the, the skills and the expertise to show where that is coming from or actually look at that and see where how I can find that information out? 
increased sales that could be in the shop. But until I asked people how they found out about me, you know, some people could be buying because they walked into the shop and they liked what they seen. Some people could be buying because they were told about me online. So I have to ask that conversation and actually then I can rank whether my social media is working, whether my website is working. Email database, if I don't ask for emails, am I going to get it? And you have to be very careful with GDPR as well that you actually are getting people to opt in, you're not just buying emails. So in terms of setting that as a goal, you need to be very aware of what the, the rules and regulations are around that before you set that as your goal. Um, so your smart goal then, increase traffic from social media to the website by 10% by the end of the year. It's achievable, but I need to know what my traffic from social media was before. What social media platforms am I talking about? Because is that fair if I just set up a social media platform to then say that it's going to increase by 10% by the end of the year? So it's not about fooling yourself. It's actually about pushing your business forward and getting your online presence to work. So your exercise then, have your goals changed since we've gone through these smart objectives? Um, is your reason for being online completely different now? Set your three key objectives for being online now, thinking about smart, thinking about if we're going to be in lockdown for the next month, the next two months, is this something that can be achieved? If I'm not selling online at the minute, do I need to change my objectives for the next three months going forward? So what we want to look at is the plan for success. Um, what I recommend is one of these per social media platform and then one for blogs, one for um, doing some work on our website. So they can always set up an Excel. There's no highfalutin plan here. This is just easy to manage, easy to do, um, but to drive our business forward um, and done with a thought process behind it. So the date then is just the date. There's nothing, you know, you just drag it down um, at the very corner and you can evolve your dates. I usually plan out per month, but some people think that it's easier to do per week or per two weeks. It is entirely up to yourself. What I would say is if you're going away on holidays, um, you don't want to be thinking about your social media platform. So if you're um, going away, so, you know, can you plan for slightly longer than what you would usually do? Um, if you're doing a week, how long have you got to, um, to give to the social media plan so that we're thinking about it? What we can see from each plan is how many times we're planning to post per week. So if this, take for instance, this is my Facebook plan, I am planning in the first week to post four times. I need to ask myself the question, is that okay? Can I stay consistent within that? If I can stay consistent within that, then it's doable. If I can't, well then I need to reassess my plan, bring that to three days a week, but it shows me that. Friday, Saturday, Sunday, what you post on a Friday is going to be very different to what you post on a Monday. People are in different mindsets and we're looking at our marketing message. On a Friday, they're thinking about the weekend. On a Monday, they're thinking about the week ahead. It's going to be very different how we talk to people. So we don't always just want to be posting on a Friday. We still have to talk to people on a Monday. But ultimately, we're thinking actually to push myself forward um, on a Friday, it'll be more sales focused, um, a harder push where on a Monday it'll be um, slightly softer and be more motivational. AM or PM, we all know that on certain days um, people will be on um, a little later or a little earlier. So instead of AM or PM, if we know our insights and we know our analytics, we can actually be putting that on at a specific time. So if 10 o'clock is our best time to be posting on Facebook, we put it on at 10 o'clock. If that's later on in the day, we put it on later on in the day. That doesn't mean that our followers aren't on at specific times. So we can be mixing that up and putting that into our plan. Yes or no simply means am I going to post or am I not going to post? Topic then, this is where our goals come in. If we know that we want to enhance PR, then we know that we need education posts, we need thought leader posts, we need um, announcements. If we know that we want uh, brand engagement, we can do announcements within brand engagement or we can do memes, um, we can ask questions. If we want sales, then it's more about a shopping day or buy online, so a link to the shop. But in terms of recapping and looking at our plan for the week, the month, the year, whatever we're planning out, we can actually say, well, I haven't put a sales post up this week. 
I haven't put a sales post up in three weeks. We can be editing this plan before we go to the like of Hoop Street um, for a scheduler to actually be scheduling posts out so that we don't have to be posting at 9.57 a.m. in the morning of that Friday when you know you'll be busy. You can actually schedule that um, to happen. And the video image or link, if you're like any of the clients that I have worked with in the past, your images are saved on your phone, on your computer. You don't know where they are and you don't know what they're saved as. So when it comes to scheduling, you have to go and look for them. What we can do then is actually put where you've saved in the image. So if you've planned out for three weeks, you don't have to go back then and go looking for this picture where we're thinking, where did I have that saved? Where was that at? And you're causing yourself stress. You actually say it's saved on um, my computer in pictures in the month of June's folder and you can go straight and put your hands on it. So this plan hopefully takes a lot of the stress away that we need and we plan as forward as we can. It might be that um, Thursday a delivery comes in and we didn't know that it was coming in. We want to put it up straight away. We can just reschedule the Thursday to another date and put, change that post around that it's um, completely different and it's about the product that came in. Okay, so um, that is the podcast over. If you have any questions, please feel free to drop me an email at patricia at fullcircle.eu.com and please do um, you know, carry out those exercises because they do help in terms of making you think um, going forward. Thank you.